Welcome to the Dental CEO Podcast, Dentistry in the Real World, where each episode we'll interview a real-world practicing dentist and learn from their success, as well as discuss tips from masters in the industry. Thanks a lot, and stay tuned for some great content on how to build a practice you love and master your profession. Hey guys, and welcome. Today I have the pleasure of introducing a practicing dentist, Dr. Charles Barretts. Dr. Barretts has built an amazing practice in downtown Denver, and he has been practicing for over 36 years. This is one of my favorite interviews to date. Dr. Barretts is a great guy, uh, a great personality, and is really passionate about some really interesting uh, marketing points and insurance points relating to how to build a practice that you love and make it profitable and efficient. So soak it all in. I hope it's great. We're going to have him back on the show because this was awesome and he has some more tips to share down the road. Well, um, you know, I actually, um, I've been practicing 36 years and I have never been the only, the only, um, the only PPO I ever subscribed to was Delta. And then about 20 years ago, I told them to get lost. <laughs> um, uh, as I realized that, um, uh, the more I, the more I looked at insurance, uh, the more I realized that, uh, I could not practice on my terms and subscribe to any, any plans. And, so I think it's 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 fairly important for dentists, particularly at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of their career, um, to recognize that the choices that they make at the beginning of the career um, can have a major impact in how they practice for the rest of their career. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was it's very attractive to. Um, Listen to the the quote unquote um, guaranteed patient flow and income that um, that corporate practices are um, are 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 enticing young dentists with, mm-hmm. and 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 you know what it's it's perfectly all right for the. I don't really make any judgments about that. It just is not for me. You know, you, you, a dentist, when they, um, when they, um, when they start their profession, they need to go back to the question that they were asked when they were interviewing for dental school. And I would bet that uh, I have no statistics, but my impression from talking to different dentists is that, uh, the vast majority of them, one of the reasons they wanted to get into the dental field is so they could be their own boss. Right. And the way they set themselves up um, either sets themselves up to do that or not to do that. And then when they decide they want to be their own boss, they need to ask themselves, what does that mean? Does that mean that they don't want to have to answer to anybody but their own um, their own core values and their own, um, their own, um, I don't even want to say gut feelings, their own knowledge base as to what is best for their patients, or do they want to, when they set their own practice, yes, yes, they own their practice. Does that mean they're working for themselves? Well, that's a question that, uh, that begs the question, because if they sign up for insurance plans, they're no longer working and no longer dictating uh, how their treatment should go. The insurance companies um, uh, delay treatment and um, and 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 do whatever they can to make it as difficult as possible for for um, for patients to receive benefits. I mean, uh, interesting. When I graduated school in 1980, the average the average. Um, yearly maximum was about a thousand dollars that's 36 years ago what's the average yearly maximum now i'm venturing to say again i don't have a good knowledge base because i don't deal with insurance that much but i'm venturing to say it's somewhere around 1500 yeah it hasn't changed so in so in 36 years the, the the benefits they pay out per year haven't changed 
have, haven't really changed. As a matter of fact, if you adjust for inflation, they've probably gone backward. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and yet, and yet, and yet, the premiums that they charge have kept up with the rates of inflation. And and, and insurance companies are very smart. That's why they have the big building and we big buildings, and we have the small offices. Uh, but the reality of the situation is, is that they're not necessarily working for themselves. Uh, they're working for um, the insurance companies. And you know what? As I say, working for a corporation. Uh, taking insurance benefits, it's all fine, well, and good for, for the, I'm going to say, the, the peak of the bell curve of dentists, the average dentist who uh, really became a dentist because they wanted to do nothing but see patients and do dentistry. Right. Um, but what many, what many dentists don't understand is that insurance, taking, taking insurance plans, is just a a a bastardized form of marketing. <laughs> That's how you're right, especially PPO. Well, the, the point is this: if you were to to define marketing, what would you? How would you define it? I would define it as activities and expenses to bring patients in to see you. Right. So. If you are going to sign up with an insurance plan, that is an activity to bring patients in to see you. And it's really interesting. I had a very interesting conversation with a member of my country club who um, he has a very different practice than mine. It's a very much bigger practice. He could probably sell it a lot easier than mine because it's a lot, a lot uh, more generic, if you will. And he's a very good dentist, but uh, he has developed a practice where he sees, you know, 15 to 25 patients a day, um, does basic dental care. He does have a specialist in his office, a uh, periodontal specialist and an orthodontic specialist. Um, but he says, how much do you spend on, on, um, on marketing? And I say, well, you know, I spend about 15% of my gross revenues. And he says, well, that's ridiculous. I don't spend anything. <laughs> right. And I said, well, you, you don't spend anything. I said, well, how much do you think is a, uh, how much do you get for a fee for service, pay, from a fee for service patient for a crown? And he said to me, he gets $1,500, which I still think is low, but that's, that's his prerogative. Okay. I said to him, uh, okay. And how much do you get from a MetLife patient? And he says, $900. I said, well, let's do the math here. I says, you join MetLife to, Bring that patient into your practice, and you you just discounted your work from fifteen hundred to nine hundred. I said that is, as far as I know, you are at that point paying forty percent for that patient on the back end, because six six hundred is forty percent of fifteen hundred. Right. Well, if you want to look at it like that, he said to me. I said, well, how else do you look at it? <laughs> I love. It. I said you you can you can now what most dentists do is they undercapitalize their new offices. I'm jumping around because uh, let's talk about the dentist who opens his new office, okay? Uh, now, I understand you have to pay the bills. Maybe you want to work. I, I worked as an associate for a year before I bought a practice and, and only another two years after that before I opened my own, another practice in a different location, sold that one. Um, but um, let's look at it. The... Most dentists uh, think that they were to that they should buy a practice for a minute for an existing that that's a, an easier way and it ensures a uh, a uh, a very very significant uh, patient base and and they get in and they're off and running and 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 I did that myself and realized when I did that myself that I lost uh, it was um, a, a practice that was. Uh, a very good practice, but I lost about two thirds of the patients going in uh, because the, it was an older dentist. He hadn't changed his fees in probably 15 years, and um, and it was I lost about two thirds, but I but I kept a third. I kept the good third, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I spent a lot of money on that um, that on buying a practice. Whereas if I were to do it over again, and what I've advised and watched other young dentists do in, 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 in the Denver area, 
is I advise them to open their own practice rather than to buy a practice. And, um, and I, but the big mistake a lot of them make is they will spend on equipment that they won't use when they open their practice. And why do you suppose they won't use that equipment? Because they don't have patience. This is not because they don't have patience. <laughs> right. So, um, so they will uh, they will invest in what you know all the state of the art equipment that the that the that the um, that the that the equipment companies are glad to sell them, and the banks are glad to loan on. And so, you know, maybe they'll throw a cone beam in, maybe they'll throw a Serac in, um, you know, and. And you know they'll they'll equip two or three operatories and and with all the latest and greatest equipment, and they don't have and, and they don't have anything in their budget for um, for marketing. Right. So, so well, Charles, how, right, question for you. Question for you. I mean, I, I love your style. I love what you're saying because I can totally identify. And well, you you know you realize as a young dentist, especially now, everyone listening, we're coming out with you know we have three hundred thousand dollars of debt. We're working for corporate practice, you know, PPOs, you know, are 80% of the plans sold. And so you're, I love your story because you're obviously really passionate. And, and, and one of the things I talk about is building the practice you love and you obviously have done that. So, I mean, what you, you're, and you have written a book called patient centered, patient centered dental, dental practice. Yeah, and it's I, a and, small book. It's and, about I, Go ahead. and I love it. I think, I think I'm going to definitely get that and check that out because I think that's, that's one of the things that, that I've learned in my short career is, is building your practice around a patient experience. But so what are the keys? I mean, you're talking about things that you've learned. How did you, how did you build a practice like this? Cause for young dentists like me, it just sounds like, you know, 80% of the plan sold. Everybody's a PPO patient. How did you actually do it? What well, did you do? it always, it always comes back to marketing. It always comes back to advertising. I've been advertising and marketing since the, 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 the moment I opened my practice. And oh, boohoo, you're $300,000 in debt. Um, well, when I got out of dental school in 1980, I went to Georgetown and I was $80,000 in debt. I'd say that's about the same. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, too many of the individuals lose track of the fact that there's an infinite amount of money. And there are ways, so I would encourage everybody to recognize that there's really no difference between being $300,000 in debt and a half a million dollars in debt. You don't have it anyway. Gotcha. So I would encourage any young dentist who wants to work for himself to, to do just that, which is find a excellent location. Now that's, that's, uh, that's a location where there is, uh, where a, you don't have, you know, not a medical dental building where you have all your competition around you. You find a location that's high, that's in a high traffic area. If it's downtown, but the most important thing, if it's downtown, it needs to be visible from the street, not in a high rise. And you need to have a really good sign. That's your most important form of marketing is to have a really good sign that's lit at night so that people could see it going by. And to start their practice modestly, um, there's a there's a there's a, a a concept that I that I have learned. It's called be do have, and by be do have, uh, it means that you need to be the dentist, do what the successful dentist has done, and then you'll have what the successful dentist has. But the the um, I, I'm going to say this, and I don't mean I, I'm not. I'm going to say it's truer in my in my observation of millennials, but there is in our society in general an attitude of be have do. Okay, I'm going to be a dentist, but before I do what a dentist, a successful dentist is going to, has done, I'm going to have all the all the accoutrements that a successful dentist has. So you go out and you buy the new car and you go out and you buy the house and you go out and you, and you, and you, um, and you buy the practice or you, and you equip the practice with all the state of the art equipment. And then you have everything the successful dentist has, but you haven't done a damn thing. <laughs> so I, I say be, do have. Now what I mean is you can start a practice 
with a good location with really a modest amount of money. And the way that's done is to purchase your equipment secondhand. Purchase only what you need to start with. And that, when you need, when you're getting out of dental school, the only thing you really need is one operatory, x-rays, and, uh, and oh, you also have to lower yourself and do your own hygiene. Gotcha. You know, and, and have a significant marketing budget to draw people to your location. And what has now, worked for you? Or how did you do that? Everything. 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 Everything, everything and anything. If you name it, I've done it. Understand I've had a, there are different strategies for different locations. Right. So if you have a, a new practice and you're a young dentist and you want to be a family practice, we need that. There's nothing wrong with that. So, you, you know, you, it wouldn't be appropriate to open up downtown where I opened because there aren't any kids there. And, you know, they, some people like the generational aspect where they see the, the mother, they see the, the, the kids, and then they see the kids' kids when they get older. And I, I love the sound of that, except I hate treating kids. <laughs> I don't want to treat kids. <laughs> I did. Same, uh, same so that's why I opened up downtown. But if you're in the suburbs, heck, Good old direct mail within a three mile radius with a ver- with a killer offer. If if you've got more time, then you have to fill it. So then you could give your time away at okay. the beginning. At the beginning, you know, you take a look at the PDS, the Pacific Dental. They've given their time away. Period. They gave forty nine dollar cleaning exams. And how much? How good an exam could they do? Right. I mean, I, I don't know if they're going to charge forty nine bucks and include a cleaning in that and an exam. And they are probably going to get 150 new patients a month doing that. Just do the math. If they gave each, if they, if they gave each patient 30 minutes of time, which if somebody has significant problems, they're going to need more than that. But if they gave each patient 30 minutes of time and they, and they have 150, well, that's 75 hours of just doing new patients. Right. When do you have, you know, so of course they have to work their asses off. <laughs> right. uh, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, you know, when I got out of school, my first jobs were for two different people. I was a dental schizophrenic. I worked for a Dr. Rick P- Kushner, who uh, at the time had Supreme Dental Group, and Rick was all about volume. As a matter of fact, Rick, uh, as a matter of fact, Rick, um, Rick uh, was the founder, and he's and he could buy and sell me right now. He's the founder of Comfort Dental, and I had to put blinders on if I was going to continue to work in his practice because, uh, and ultimately he let me go because he told me my work was too precision for his office. <laughs> Rick's a, too good. Rick is Rick is, is is he might have been saying I was too slow. Whatever he was saying, it wasn't the right match. Right, and then. I worked for another group, which was the Cody Dental Group, which were, which were all panky trained doctors, and um, and they had they weren't very humanistic. They were very very arrogant and elitist. Very good dentists, but um, hold on one second, please. Julia, Julia, did you tell Mama I'm on a call? I'll call her when I'm done. So, so, but they were incredibly good dentists and incredibly good technicians, but the, the, the human side of it, they were lacking. Okay. So, uh, I had to take what I learned from both of those individuals and put it in a blender and have a humanistic practice that, um, that wasn't, that was all about quality. And my core values were to do excellent work in, in, in the most comfortable environment possible. That's never changed. It's only it's only I've only broadened that, and and ultimately uh, I, I purchased that practice and realized that that's not what I wanted. So I opened my practice downtown. I, I wanted to be downtown, but in 1980, when I came to Denver, believe it or not, there was no space because there was nothing but uh, nothing but but construction cranes downtown. Right. Uh, it was so uh, so I had to wait three or four years, and then I opened my practice. And again. I opened with two two operatories. Uh, I had you know I had some following already, and um, so so I'm rambling. But you know the point is is that you can open a practice very modestly, and if you're in the suburbs, snail mail, uh, direct mail. 
uh, I actually opened up downtown and actually um, got down on the street with uh, and hired some other people, and I gave out brochures to passerbys with free toothbrushes. That's awesome. And, and you know, with a good offer, and basically built the practice between 1984 and 1987, which was thriving. Then we had a oil bust here, and I lost two-thirds of my practice again. So, you know, this is not the, – the fee-for-service – uh, arena is not for the faint of heart. Right. Um, there are slow days where you wonder, you know, but the point I, the, the, the way I, um, the way I set my fees is if I am booked more than a day in advance, I know my fees are too low. Why? Because I am doing comprehensive complex care now at this point in my career where I need to catch people uh, when they're when they're ready to do their dentistry and don't give them a chance to have second thoughts. So consequently, I need gaps in my schedule. Because you do it same and day, you get it done. I get it done. Plan it, and, you get it done. And the other thing that I have developed, I shouldn't say I have developed, I have I have ta- I have I have titled, is the concept of the super dentist, and the super dentist. Is comes from my growing up with the legion of superheroes. Okay, and you have in the legion of superheroes, you have uh, Aquaman who's really good in water, and the Hulk who's really strong, and 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 uh, and Spider Man who who can climb and do fun funny things with spider webs, and and uh, a Batman who's high tech since the day one, and um, and uh, but. All of those superheroes all have one power. Now, I believe all dentists are superheroes. I believe we do super things for our patients, and every one of us is a superhero. But if the world is spinning off its axis and the polar ice caps are melting, you need, super, you need Superman with all the powers. So consequently, what I have done in my career is I made a commitment very early on to learn to do one procedure every six months just one every six months that I currently was referring out. Gotcha. Advanced, it started advanced with procedures. Me. Keep them in it house. It started with, exactly. It started with me with endo. That's the most, I mean, when you think about dental emergencies, the most common dental emergency is endo. Right. And so if you're not doing endo on first molars, gosh, you're referring out a lot of things. You know, I always say it's the, it's, it's, it's the, it's the it's the um, it's the Lexus or the poinsettia. Which would you rather have? If you have one emergency a week and you get fifteen hundred dollars for for a um, for a root canal, okay, then you have fifty. Let's say you take two weeks off. You have fifty times fifteen hundred. What is that? Seventy five thousand dollars in production. Is that about right? Right. Oh, yeah, that's going to buy a nice Lexus, okay? <laughs> right. Or you can send them out to the endodontist. And at Christmas, you get a poinsettia. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Uh... The point is, the point is, why send that money out the door? And the other thing is, is that why, if a patient's in pain, and the first thing you do is refer them out, how much confidence have, you, have they have they? gotten in you at that point in time and will you see them again right the answer is maybe the answer is very little because you were unable to help them out of pain and the other you know unless you open it up and send them out but if you're opening them up you might as well treat them right but you know what happens is that piggybacks and if you if you take a look at it and you do one one procedure every six months just one that's a, that's a reasonable goal isn't it yeah right Start, yeah. start with so, so what'd you do endo surgery implants sleep medicine yes endo oh. implants surgery and then with surgery it was with, with with implants it was then okay now take the mini residency and learn how to do sinus lifts and and, and bone grafting and right. and uh and 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 apicoectomies if you're doing endo and 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 cosmetic crown lengthening, crown lengthening to get a two millimeter ferrule. I mean, these are all these are all related topics, right. and they are. They, trust me, they're not rocket science either. 
Uh, the specialist will let, let you believe that. I mean, and Invisalign. Right. Okay, and then you're doing Invisalign, and then, okay, you're doing, um, <laughs> excuse me, you're doing early Invisalign. Okay, well, now how about doing advanced Invisalign? Okay, and now Invisalign, everybody and their brother's doing Invisalign, so it becomes a commodity, and commodities are only based on pricing. But wait a minute, what if you can do Invisalign in half the time? Are you familiar with Propel? Yeah, that's the accelerator, correct? Yes. Yeah. Do you use it? I do not use it. Why not? <laughs> I don't know. I should, I guess, right? Well, let me ask you something. If you are doing Invisalign and you can do it more predictably in half the time, does that have more or less value to a person? Definitely going to be a, a great marketing point. Definitely value. Not even a market. I'm not even talking about marketing point because it is a differentiator, and we can talk about differentiators for, for go, go on and on. But if a patient can get Invisalign done more predictably, meaning those, those difficult cuspid rotations become more predictable, and instead of changing their trays out every two weeks, you change them out every week, if you're on the other side of the, the fence, does that have more or less value to you? Definitely more. Um, yeah. Definitely more. So then you could charge more. Right. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Let me do it the old way and charge less and take longer. <laughs> or let me do it or do it with acceleration. You're differentiating your practice. So then it becomes a marketing point. You have to understand that marketing, in order to be able to market, you have to have true differentiators. In my practice, we, because it's 36 years of continuously doing this, I just learned the pinhole technique. I learned LANAP. Um, you know, I'm actually went to a seminar and this year, um, uh, for, for this six months, I will be purchasing a, uh, a, a scanner and, and, um, a scanner to be able to do bigger cases. Uh, but, but even to this point, when I buy technology and I, the scanner isn't that big of an investment, but when I buy big, 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 big investment technology, when I bought an iCat for my office, I bought a five-year-old iCat. Right. Instead of paying one hundred eighty thousand, I paid sixty thousand. Right. Love it. When I when I bought it, I I just got involved in Serac. That was one of the things. And that I got involved about two 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 and a half years ago, and investigated the difference between um, and Serac for me is the ability to do posterior crowns in one visit. And there's a marketing point, okay, but. Um, it has value to patients. So should it be cheaper or should it be more? Well, if it's, if, if you're adding value, you add dollars. Right. But the point is, but when I went out to buy a Serac, I didn't buy an Omnicam. Right. You bought the Why? blue cam. Why? Because it, I bought the blue cam. That's and you know funny. where I bought it? I did the same thing. Exactly. And you know where I bought it? eBay. eBay. I did the same thing. And That's hilarious. And I got involved in Serac. All in with it with an in lab MCXL and materials all in, including rebuilding that MCXL. So I'm going to throw in another five thousand dollars, all in for thirty five thousand dollars. <laughs> That's my exact story, Charles. So I love what you're saying because I mean, you're these are great tips. I mean, as new dentists, humble yourself, control your costs, ramp up, build a practice, and find patients that you love to work with and go out and do it. So what you're saying. I mean, train yourself. Well, and make train it yourself. Yeah, and it, that, that takes time. So, takes but, you time. know, in the beginning, in the beginning, you know how many dentists I, I've, I've, I've had as a, uh, talked to as associates and said, would you be willing to do hygiene on the days you're here? Oh, no, I don't do hygiene. Right. You know what? I'm 36 years out of school. And on, on, on Tuesday, um, I'm going to be doing, um, I'm going to be doing, the patient needs um, full mouth root planing. He needs four root canals. He needs um, three extractions, two implants. Uh, guess what? I'm doing the root planing. Why? To try to coordinate that with my hygienist would be impossible. Right. Get it done. I don't mind doing it. Get it done. And don't, don't, I'm a dentist. You know, I'm, I'm a dentist. I don't have to do what the successful dentist does. I just want to have what the successful dentist has, which is, oh, I have to have a hygienist. That's forty dollars an hour. When I'm not making anything, when the hygienists, if you employ them, are going to make more than you are. <laughs> right. No, I love it. This is interesting. I mean, that's that's kind of my motto too. Is as I'm trying to train myself. I'm a young dentist. 
Um, I do my hygiene. If I've got an opening and someone wants to come in, I'll do the scaling rip planning because it's six months to book with hygiene in our office. So, I mean, and, and now here's the deal. It, it, here's the deal. Okay. And you're an insurance practice. I'm not saying you. I'm saying if somebody's an insurance practice, do you know that uh, there have been studies that show that rip planning curatage done all at once is more effective than done in quadrants? Right. Why? You don't debreed a quarter of a wound. Okay. And yet the insurance companies force you to do it in quadrants. No more than two quadrants at a time. Right. Why? Because they hope that the patient won't come back and they won't have to pay. <laughs> I've always wondered about that. And actually, they, they're actually debating and, and, yeah, not reimbursing for four quadrants done, even though it saves time. It's more convenient and better for the patient. That's interesting. That well, they, they the question is, that. are you who are you working for? Are you working for your patients or are you working for the insurance company? And I don't know what your situation is. However, if you are needing the insurance flow, that's one thing. Uh, but there are ways of getting out of insurance. Um, and, not, and, and as I say, it's not for everybody because the marketing, uh, marketing is an ever-evolving uh, discipline as is dentistry. Right. So as I say, one of the, I don't know if I ever uh, – the one thing I will be buying this year is a, is a full-mouth scanner. I'm probably going to buy one of the TRIOS scanners just because uh, I do big enough cases. And if I can start to eliminate impression materials from the practice, I think it's certainly the way of the future. Right. I think um, so, so um, well, and, uh, and I can afford it. I mean, I think this is awesome, Charles. I, this first time we've actually spoken, I love, I love your style and your message. You're, you're great. I mean, so would you, I would love to have you on again at some point and kind of go over lesson number two, Charles lesson number two. Um, what, what, you know, the listeners right now, what could they do to contact you? If they want to learn more and learn about your, your story, your system, um, how can they reach you? They can email me directly at drbarrett's at barrett'sdental.com. That's D-R-B-A-R-O-T-Z at barrett'sdental.com. That's the best way to, okay. uh, to get a hold of me. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, you know, the, you know, what we could talk about next time is um, you know is is a marketing cycle for a fee for service dentist, yeah. and it starts with the first it starts with the first phone call. Uh, it starts with the with the with the realization that if you are a fee for service practice, you are not for everybody. It's, it starts with being okay with that. It starts with the understanding of knowing that some will, some won't, some wait. Uh, learning how to differentiate between the some wills, the people who are ready to go, the some wants, the people who are just not appropriate for your practice, and the some waits, the people who are very often thrown out like a baby with the bathwater or something like that, uh, the shoppers, and how important it is to have a database for the some waits so that they, when they're shopping, you stay in their forefront of mind so that when they're ready to make a buying decision, they choose you. It then goes into then going into how they're greeted when they arrive at the office, uh, how they make commitment over the phone so that we don't have the standard uh, 50 to 60% no-show rate for new patients. Uh, all, all new patients, no matter what, even a free consultation, there is a deposit taken over the phone. You say, well, wait a minute, a free consultation deposit? Yeah, we ask them for $50 to hold their time, and it's refunded to them on the way in when they show up. Yeah, and if they don't call and don't show, we, we want them to have a little skin in the game. It's about interviewing, giving the patients a tour. It's about giving the, doing an interview with the patients. And at the interview, gaining commitment at the very, very beginning of the relationship, before they've really paid you, you know, before they've done anything with you, gaining co- commitment from them that if they have been completely satisfied, that they will leave you a five-star review on social network. Right. So you have a complete you have the complete cycle, and then you have to have the systems in place. And I could talk for probably four hours on that, but we can make it. I've, I've given you just the, that's the trailer, if you I will. Love it. I so love it. Um, let's put that on as as lesson two. That's a great trailer. I, I'm going to check out your book too, and I'll post that too with this link. But thank you so much for your time. I I love chatting with you. I think I think I want to I want to hang out more and hear more of your story because I can I can identify everything you said is interesting. I, my practice is actually downtown Minneapolis, so. Um, uh-huh, similar uh-huh. story, but, um, well, thank you so much, Charles. I appreciate it. Now I'll, I'll keep oh, you posted. Let's do it again. Monday.
All right, guys, that concludes our interview with Dr. Barretts. If you would like to contact Dr. Barretts, just visit his website. You can go to www.barotzdental.com. And there's a link on there where you can send him an email, and he would love to chat with you if you want to learn more. Otherwise, stay tuned to our podcast, the Dental CEO Podcast, Dentistry in the Real World. I'm going to be coming out with a continual supply of real-world stories from practicing dentists and masters in the industry. So if this helps, uh, shoot me an email. If you want to learn more about how to start your own practice, check out my program, um, Dental CEO Practice Launch Coaching, where I can work with you one-on-one to help you build your own practice, uh, get your own practice off the ground, either buying or starting from scratch. So thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day.